Supreme Court ruled today that the CFPB is unconstitutional. What does this mean for industry? What does it mean for the participants in that litigation? This is the Mortgage Banking live stream. Today in Sela Law, the Supreme Court issued its long-awaited decision regarding the constitutionality of the Supreme Court, of the uh, CFPB, rather. We're going to talk about that with some, uh, some depth today, and I'm Troy Garris. This is the Mortgage Banking live stream. We are here to connect. We are here to in- educate you. We're here to entertain, provide you information, and this is the reason for our being couple shouts out as we get started. First of all, as I've said before, the Texas MBA is holding its annual symposium. This is going to be September 14th and 15th at Dallas Legacy West. They are also uh, planning for an online experience as well. And as the coronavirus uh, epidemic and pandemic uh, continues to evolve, the uh, the details of that conference also will continue to, to evolve. What I do know is that they have, as always, they have a fantastic lineup of speakers and content, and it's, it's an event that you will not want to miss. The Texas MBA, you can look it up at texasmba.org. Great people. As everyone knows, I'm actively involved there, and I love that organization. You should get involved. There's a, there's a lot of good people to meet, a lot of information and activities and, and connections that you can make there. Uh, it's one of my favorite organizations. A lot of other good organizations out there as well, but the Texas MBA is dear to my heart. One more update and reminder, the CFPB released a couple of notices of proposed rulemaking for the GSE patch that uh, those uh, NPRMs are out there uh, waiting for people to comment. Uh, You will have a limited period, 60 days to comment. And if you want to get your voice heard, either individually or through an organization that you work with or work for, or if you want to participate in such a with an association like the Mortgage Bankers Association, the, the National MBA, as an example, uh, definitely you want to get involved and make sure that you have your voice heard. The GSE patch is critical to our industry. It's an industry that's done very well, but these types of, of areas where uh, the you know unforeseen um, areas can can uh, work to our disadvantage and to the public's disadvantage are, are, are an area where you want to make sure that you get your voices heard. So get involved, get a response into those notices of proposed rulemaking on the GSE patch, uh, because that will change the face of industry depending on how it comes out. Questions or comments? As you know, you can you can call me. My phone number is 301-461-8952. You can text me at that number. You can email me, troy at garrishorn.com. You can just, if you're on YouTube, all this information, by the way, is on YouTube. In the description just below, you can even comment on YouTube and we will uh, respond to your comments. So if you want information about what we're talking about today, you want a copy of this SALA law decision, for example, or you want related information um, that you might want to get easy access to, we provide information and uh, it's, it's, uh, these are things that we can easily link you to. Uh, We can also connect you uh, to people that you want to talk to. Um, Like like I say, part of the mission of this live stream is to connect people and and we're happy to do that. There's been some, uh, some, uh, movement in the in the marketplace, some of which I can't talk about yet uh, because the the parties involved have not yet said anything. But um, there's some movement out there. The mortgage industry is strong and remains strong in some somewhat to some people's surprise, uh, given everything that's going on. But I will say that the the hiring remains strong and the industry, as a general matter, remains strong. People call me and they want to uh, find out if there are opportunities available in the marketplace. There are. There are uh, companies that call me and, and uh, reach out to me and they want to know if, if I know any good people. Um, there are some good people out there and looking for positions. 
Um, I'm, I'm not a headhunter. I don't get paid for this. I don't do anything, but I do, uh, in that regard, but I, I do connect people and, and people can just, you know, I provide information. People can talk, they can figure out whatever they want to do or not do. Uh, but it is something that, that, uh, we offer, uh, to, uh, to people as a service. So if you just want to reach out to me, um, a couple of, of, uh, shouts out again, uh, Kathy Thomas, uh, I, I, I talked to Kathy, with some regularity and uh, she's doing great things out there always has uh kathy thomas is uh, uh making moves in in this industry as always uh, making sure that she's involved and, and a very active participant in the texas mba and uh actually working on that symposium and uh a, a great person to know um let's dive right into sailor law so the cfpb just this morning issued its opinion in the Sailor Law matter. Now, what is Sailor Law? Sailor Law is a law firm out in California, and Sailor Law is in, involved in certain activities related to the mortgage industry and to um, and to debt collection efforts and the like. Sailor Law got a CID from the CFPB, and I won't get into the details, but Sailor Law decided uh, that it didn't need to comply with that CID, the Civil Investigative Demand, which is kind of like a subpoena. They, the CFPB will send companies and individuals these CIDs and ask for information, sometimes lots of information, and demand that the the companies or the individuals supply the information. Well, Sailor Law thought that the CFPB was structured in an unconstitutional manner, and so it declined to comply with that CID. The CFPB then took Sailor Law to uh, to court in the district court in California, and the district court told Sailor Law, you're going to have to comply with the CID, you're going to have to provide the information. Sailor appealed. The Ninth Circuit similarly said the CID was issued by a constitutional agency, the CFPB, and so Sailor was going to have to comply with the CID, provide the information, and Sailor again appealed. And the Supreme Court took the case up. And today, the Supreme Court, in, in its decision, in a, it's a long decision, a lot of details, and a lot, a lot of interesting details. If you're a lawyer and you, you like the constitutional law analyses uh, that you find coming out of the Supreme Court, this is a fascinating opinion. Um, but boiled down, uh, the, the Supreme Court said that the CFPB was unconstitutionally created but then it also said that there was a fix, a relatively straightforward fix, if the, uh, if the director of the CFPB was made an at-will employee. So unconstitutionally created, but corrected if the director became an at-will employee that would be terminable at will by the president. So this actually, in, and interestingly, is a very similar result that uh, the PHH decision um, authored the initial PHH decision authored by, uh, at that time, Judge Kavanaugh um, at the D.C. Circuit uh, came to a, to a similar conclusion. And so th this is now the decision of the Supreme Court. Judge Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, is on the uh, Supreme Court at this time, as, as you well know. But essentially, it's an interesting mix also of the justices that um, interpreted this, uh, interpreted the constitutional provisions and requirements, and came out with a an interesting split among the justices. So the justices that a lot, a lot of times people refer to, you got the conservative justices and the liberal justices. It's not that simple, it, and almost invariably, it's not that simple. But for the the justices that um, most people often refer to as the conservative justices. Um, there was a, a, a ruling by, by the five individuals that, that uh, people frequently refer to as the conservative justices. And, and so those five decided in this opinion that the CFPB was unconstitutionally created in its structure. On the other hand, two of those justices, two of the so-called conservative justices, declined to uh, agree to the constitutional fix of just making the provision about at-will employment, you know, making that provision severable and taking it out. So there was a, a five to four split in declaring the 
agency constitutional or unconstitutional rather, but only three of those justices uh, decided that the agency's fix, or the that the fix would be uh, that the court should go ahead and rule now on this decision to make those uh, to make the director at will. The so-called liberal justices, again, it's never that simple, but the so-called liberal justices declined to follow the, or join the decision that talked about the agency being unconstitutional, but they did join with regard to the severability and making the director an at-will employee. So this is, in a sense, kind of a hodgepodge of differing views on how the law should be interpreted and uh, a piecing together of these differing views. There are a couple of concurring decisions as well, concurring opinions as well, and uh, other justices that are joining in those um, concurring and, and actually also dissenting opinions. And so fascinating read. It's, it's, it's a relatively um, complete or, or thorough type of analysis. So it's, you know, it's, it's a, you know, about 100 pages long, but it's, you know, it's not that long of a read. Truthfully, uh, the spacing is pretty big. The, the font is pretty big. So I encourage you to read it because it's a fascinating vision or view or insight of how our uh, constitutional system works. Um, and you can agree or not agree with the with the opinion, but I will tell you that this opinion itself and the way that it's written and the different conflicting views um, will give you a lot of insight into both how our system works, which is you know every American really should know, and then also how these particular justices view uh, the way that our system works and the way that our system should work in the context of these very specific facts of the CID that was sent to this law firm out in California. Now, what next in, in CELA? What is the next step? Well, that's actually a little unclear. So the, the uh, court's decision says that, um, actually, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read it to you. It says, we remand for the Court of Appeals, the Ninth Circuit, we remand to the court of, for the Court of Appeals to consider whether the CID was validly ratified. And so what happens next, practically speaking, is that this case will go back to the Ninth Circuit for further proceedings consistent with this Supreme Court decision. And then the Ninth Circuit will have to figure that out. And included in that, and the Ninth Circuit could just remand back actually to the district court if it deemed that that was the appropriate step. Um, but it would just, whatever decision came out would have to be consistent with the Supreme Court case. And so is this current, would CELA have to respond and, and now reply and, and provide information with regard to this CID? I don't think that's clear. The justices, I, I, they did not get into, they purposely left that uh, decision um, to the lower courts. Um, and would these, what would the CFPB do? Would it now go forward and issue a new CID to make sure that it didn't have any defects that might arise out of the old one? Um, could, it just, could the CID just be ratified? There are a lot of open questions here. Nobody really knows the answers to these, and people have some, some viewpoints probably and, and some speculation about how the courts might come out. But I don't think anybody, there's no real definitive answer, and that's why the Supreme Court, which often takes a fairly light hand and a broad brush, and it just sends that uh, decision back to the Ninth Circuit. So that's where it's going to be. Now, what, it also raises other questions, though. Like, if you had a CID already, what happens if, you've had, if you have a CID and you haven't answered it? Well, this is, this is some of the lack of clarity and some of what the lower courts will have to struggle through and figure out. What about the prior rules that have been issued by a C, the CFPB while it was unconstitutional? What happens there? Well, these are some questions that my guess is that they would uh, be raised in the context, especially of, a, of an enforcement action. And uh, these are all uh, valid questions that people might raise in connection with future litigation. Um, again, a fascinating decision and especially intriguing for attorneys who, uh, who like this kind of uh, like these kinds of issues. Um, but as far as the practical aspect of it is that the current CFPB, um, while unconstitutionally initially created, has now been 
declared to be able to be fixed with this uh, provision of, of taking out the, the for cause provision, so to speak, uh, where the director could be terminated only for cause and making that person, that director, an at-will employee. It also creates interesting implications for the next administration, whatever the next administration is, and whether it's uh, this, you know, this coming year or four years from now or, or, or um, you know, future uh, administrations when and wherever they come. So the question of if you are currently the head, the director of CFPB, and let's say there was a change of administrations, for example, um, you know, what happens then? It makes that uh, director uh, terminable at will uh, by the decision of the, of the president. So lots of changes that could be in store. And this is a, a case that you will want to read. Um, I will note that the justices in the decision, they were they were quite concerned with the disruption in the markets that would come from a decision that just tore down the entire CFPB. So uh, I think they were cognizant of that. And, um, you know, my, my guess is that a lot of the industry was very concerned also about uh, a CFPB being ruled unconstitutional from the, from, uh, you know, ab initio or, or from the beginning uh, so that all of the changes, all of the things that we had lived with so far, um, you know, what happens with all of those and, and uh, nobody quite knew or knows where that would go. So, um, you know, that's something to, that the justice certainly were cognizant about. As before, the justices also believe, and they reiterate this, and this is sometimes it gets uh, tangled up into the politics of the day and, and the tense politics of, of our, our current times. But the justices here, as is pretty typical, they tend to try to take a fairly light touch and try to leave the decisions of uh, of the, the the legislature to the legislature and try not to have uh, you know nine justices overrule the will of the of the people. So they're very cognizant of that, very cognizant of of the um, judges and justices and the judicial system's place in American politics and that delicate balance of powers between the three branches of government. So there you have it. A fantastic decision. I encourage you to read it. If you want a copy of it, I'll send it to you. Just reach out to me, and um, and I think you will find this intriguing. The the uh, the decision, the the majority opinion, the one that that got, garnered enough uh, votes from each of the justices to be the the majority opinion and the one that controls. Um, that in itself is only um, is only about thirty five pages long, and um, a, a a pretty a pretty quick read for somebody who is interested, and uh, I, I encourage you to to take a look at that. I'm Troy Garris. This is the Mortgage Banking Live Stream. If you want to reach out to me, my contact information is below. Um, if you feel that we are providing good information, hit the subscribe button, and uh, you'll be notified when, whenever we do these live streams. We do these twice a week. Once a week, we have an interview with somebody that uh, is important to our industry. Uh, we feel that this is, this industry has been very good to us, and we are just trying to be good back to you and and uh, give back to the community, to the industry in in an, in a uh, in a community that that we love and adore. And uh, hopefully, this is helpful. Subscribe, please, if you uh, feel if you so feel, and if you don't, that's quite all right. And we will see you again um, in a couple of days. Have a fantastic day and a fantastic week. Troy Garris, Mortgage Banking Livestream.